Hello dear brothers and sisters, friends, members of the Anaheim and Orange SDA churches. Welcome to another day of Read Through the Bible 2021. Pastor Mark, happy to be with you again, coming to you from the offices at the Orange SDA church. Hope your week has been blessed. We are filming for the 17th of July, Sabbath, and we've got some wonderful chapters for you today. We've got Joshua 24, last chapter of Joshua, end of an era in many aspects. We've got Jeremiah 13. We've got Matthew 27, hugely consequential, the apex of our faith. And we've got Acts chapter 4, that January Pastor Mark is going to be taking you through. We, of course, want to ask uh, the Lord Jesus to accompany us as we dive in. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for bringing us through another week to a well-deserved Sabbath. We pray that we can rest in you and be refreshed and be encouraged by the Holy um, assembly in your sanctuary, dear Lord. Pray for blessing both at Anaheim and Orange uh, this Sabbath, that people would come away encouraged, blessed, galvanized, energized, dear Lord, to live out kingdom life and share it with others eagerly. We want to pray, dear Lord, as we delve into the Word today, that it would be with your accompaniment, dear Holy Spirit, you who inspired the prophets. We ask your softening influence on our hearts, dear Lord. Uh, may we get a right concept of you. May we understand the, uh, the will that you have for us going forward. And may we live it out joyfully, reflecting your goodness. Pray a blessing for all church members at the Anaheim and Orange SDA churches today and onward. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so we are in the last chapter of Joshua. Here, since yesterday's chapter, chapter 23, Joshua has been giving his farewell speech to the leaders, and this is a very emotional time. Of course, whenever a leader passes away, it's a big time of transition, lots of big questions and question marks. Chapter 23 was mostly exhortations to keep the laws and get rid of the idols and keep the covenant. Uh, chapter 24 continues that theme, but for probably fully half of the chapter, he takes uh, the people through a history, reminding them of the history of all that God has done. Uh, let's see, it talks about he assembled everybody at Shechem. That town might sound familiar to you. That is the town where Jacob had settled outside and had made a treaty with the king about living there. And then you remember that Jacob's daughter Dinah or Dina was raped by uh, the son of the king, and so they made a deal about if your people will get circumcised, then we'll intermarry. But the brothers took revenge and slaughtered everybody in the town while they were in the weakness and the fever from the circumcision. So that gory story, we're back at the same site. That's going to come important right toward the end of the chapter here. So Joshua reminds them kind of a summative history of all we've been reading since Genesis. Starts with Abraham, how God took Abraham out of his father's household and brought him into this land. He gave him Isaac. Remember, that was a miraculous birth uh, after Sarah was well past the years of her fertility. Uh, and then we had Jacob and Esau. Uh, Jacob and his family moved down to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron and the affliction of the Egyptians in the form of the plagues. Then, of course, they came to the sea and God parted the sea and hurled the charioteers from the Egyptians into the sea when it covered them up. And then, uh, end of verse 7, then you lived in the desert for a long time. <laughs> yes, we remember, decades. Then it talks about, verse 8, bringing them to the land of the Amorites, who fought against you, but I gave them into your hands. And then you had the problem of Balak and Balaam, the king and the prophet, who were trying to get a curse on Israel, but it didn't work, and it turned into a blessing. Then, verse 11, you crossed the Jordan River. That was a miracle, also of water. Came to Jericho. Don't forget how Jericho fell before them. And drove out seven nations stronger than yourself. I gave them into your hands, end of verse 11. Verse 12, this is interesting. I sent hornets ahead of you and drove them out before you. Probably metaphorical hornets, but I like the end of verse 12. You did not do it with your own sword. Remember, I fought for you with these nations, driving them out of the land of Israel. I like that too. It's, I was going to say, it's less ethically problematic and messy. Uh, God says, I'll take the brunt. Uh, you guys don't have to commit as many war atrocities. Although they certainly did participate in some of them. But verse 13 sums it up well. I gave you a land on which you did not toil and cities you did not build. And you live in them and eat from vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. Don't forget that you got this free 
God says. By the way, through this whole thing, God is speaking in the first person. Joshua starts, this is what the Lord says. And then all the eyes refer to Yahweh the Lord. Now, verse 14, fear Yahweh, serve him with all faithfulness, throw away the gods of your forefathers worshipped, and serve Yahweh. And then here's our big memory verse for the day, verse 15. I think I use this uh, semi-frequently as a memory verse in the uh, Bible classes I used to teach. But if serving Yahweh seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve Yahweh. And it's true, most of the time when I see that memory verse, there's like an ellipsis in the middle, dot, dot, dot. Um, in fact, we have um, my cousin got us a gift one year, like a housewarming gift, and it's a stitched throw rug, and it has this verse, that with the ellipsis, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, dot, dot, dot. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord, Yahweh. Amen. So Joshua, it's decision time, guys. I know what I'm doing. Do you know what you're doing? People respond in verse 16, Far be it from us to forsake Yahweh and to serve other gods. And then they kind of give a shorter history. It was Yahweh our God himself who brought us and our fathers out of Egypt and performed these great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey. And Yahweh drove out before us the nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve Yahweh because he is our God. Now, this sounds very good. You would think Joshua would say, very good, that's wonderful. But he, he actually kind of gives a discouraging, like you really can't do it. I wonder if this is like reverse psychology to make them really rev up. Yes, 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 we definitely will. But look what Joshua says here in 19. Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve Yahweh. He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you forsake Yahweh and serve foreign gods, he will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he has been good to you. But the people said to Joshua, No, we will serve Yahweh. <laughs> so it seems to me like a little bit of reverse psychology to really get him to rev up. Then Joshua said, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve Yahweh. That's an interesting phrase. We've seen many... I think, yeah, Isaiah and Psalms, you know, they said, I call the earth and heavens as a witness against you. But here he's saying, you're a witness against yourself. Your future selves will be condemned by the words you're saying right now. The people, verse 24, said to Joshua, we will serve Yahweh our God and obey him. I guess he's satisfied by that third affirmation there. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped a, a verse there. I'm sorry. Latter part of verse 22. Yes, we are witnesses, they replied. Now then, said Joshua, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord God of Israel. And then there's that third one. We will serve Yahweh and obey him. So this is advice for us too, right? Throw away any distraction, anything that gets in the way. I know we don't have idols in the same way that they did. We don't have the same type of temptation that they did back in the land of Canaan. But we certainly have things that fill our mental space. Whether it's ambition or jealousy or hatred or materialism or pursuing fame, riches, sports, glamour, political affiliation, all that stuff. Put all that stuff away and yield your hearts to God. Please, dear friends, please, dear friends, let nothing on Judgment Day, let the records show that there is nothing in our hearts more high priority, more fervently pursued than God, His kingdom, His righteousness. Verse 25, On that day Joshua made a covenant for the people, and there at Shechem he drew up for them decrees and laws. Man, this guy's about to die, and he's like writing up a contract, right? Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. And he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak near the holy place of Yahweh. Probably he got some younger, stronger guys to set up the stone. But you know, when he initiates it, when he says, go do it, uh, the account says he did it. See, he said to all the people, this stone will be a witness against us. Ooh, he's included in that. It has heard the words Yahweh has said. I'm thinking, what? The stone has heard? This is a personification of an inanimate object, right? But the stone is a monument. Monuments are to remind us, and the stone will be a witness against us. It will be a witness against you if you are untrue to your God. 
Verse 28, then Joshua sent the people away, each to his own inheritance. Everybody going home fully resolved in their hearts to serve Yahweh. After these things, Joshua, the servant of Yahweh, died at the age of 110. This is interesting. Uh, the same age as Joseph. Uh, my study Bible said to go back to uh, Genesis 50, verse 26. And the text note on that one said that Egyptians viewed 110 as like the ideal lifespan. We would today count that as an extremely fortunate lifespan. But interesting that it's the same. I thought maybe coincidence, but look, two verses later, it's going to talk about Joseph. It talks about how they buried him there in the hill country of Ephraim. Uh, verse 31, I love this. This is like happy ending in the short medium term. Israel served Yahweh throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him who had experienced everything Yahweh had done for Israel. And verse 32, Joseph's bones, which the Israelites had brought up from Egypt this whole time, they've been lugging their bones since the end of the book of Genesis, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all the way to the end of Joshua. They buried the bones at Shechem in the tract of land that Jacob had bought for a hundred pieces of silver from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. This became the inheritance of Joseph's descendants. So if you look on that map of Israel, the Joseph uh, inheritance land is there. Let's see, we got the two half-tribes, half Manasseh and Ephraim. Uh, it must have been in one of those two half-tribes where this land was. I'll check. Verse 33, And Eliezer, son of Aaron, died and was buried at Gibeah, which had been allotted to his son Phinehas, in the hill country of Ephraim. So big transition time. The leaders of the second generation are now dying away. Um, there's always a question, what direction will Israel take? Thankfully, Joshua picked up the baton from Moses, faithfully carried it. He certainly isn't as renowned as Moses, certainly didn't write as much as Moses. Moses wrote five books where Joshua uh, purportedly wrote one book, and even that, not a hugely long one. 24 chapters, it's less than half as long as Genesis. But, I mean, he finished, it's kind of like uh, Moses took the baton 90% of the way, and then Joshua finished it. Of course, the Lord had to do just as big a work, just as big a work, pushing out those nations ahead of Israel in Canaan as he did getting them out of Egypt. So, in some ways, I guess you could say Joshua is as high and potent and powerful a prophet as Moses was. But in some ways, I mean, even the relationship of Moses, they said nobody was like Moses talking to God face to face. We never saw that expression with Joshua here. So, but he faithfully exhorted the people. And if we think the exhortations are too much, oh, come on, enough of these exhortations. We'll do it already. Well, it lasted for a while, but the story continues. Book of Judges begins tomorrow. We already have the book overview uploaded. So if you haven't watched that already, look here at the Anaheim Sunkist uh, YouTube page. Uh, check out Book of Judges Overview. It's something like nine minutes. I filmed it a day or two ago. Uh, so take a look at that, and when we will get into the Book of Judges, quick spoiler, it is crazy. Judges is, I think, the craziest book in the Old Testament. But it's going to be really interesting reading. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for having been on the journey. It almost feels like we're ending the Pentateuch again. We're, we're ending this important chapter. Uh, but, yeah, Moses didn't quite, quite finish it. Joshua did. Praise the Lord. And then we'll see what judges, what Israel does through the period of the judges uh, in the land God has uh, opened up for them. All right, very good. At this time, we'll move on to Jeremiah chapter 13. And here in Jeremiah 13, we see God using a couple of illustrations from everyday items to teach lessons to Israel. Now, this, uh, to me, ties in with Jesus master teacher who very commonly used everyday situations and materials to bring out spiritual lessons. Uh, in the book overview, I'd mentioned, uh, that I'd mentioned briefly that several times God has a Jeremiah do illustrative stuff and then say, in such a way, so will it be with Israel. So the first um, 11 verses, it's kind of like God is sending Jeremiah on a scavenger hunt. And I'm sure Jeremiah is kind of scratching his head and Okay, why am I doing this exactly? At the end it, it becomes known, but um, I think it means that we are at times to obey even though we don't know how it's going to finish out. So let's summarize it here. Verse thir uh, chapter 13. This is what Yahweh said to me. Go and buy a linen belt and put it around your waist, but do not let it touch water. Okay, went out, bought a linen belt as God directed, put it around my waist. 
Then the word of Yahweh came to me a second time. Take the belt that you bought and are wearing around your waist, and now go to Perath and hide it there in a crevice in the rocks. Um, my study Bible says that a translation of Perath can also be the Euphrates River. That would be quite a journey if it was from Jerusalem. Uh, so anyway, he's going to go to a whole other town to bury this belt in the rocks. Okay, I went and did it, as Yahweh told me. Many days later, Yahweh said to me, Now go back to Perath and get the belt I told you to hide there. So I went to Para, and he's like, i got to go back to this other town again. Dug up the belt and took it from the place where I had hidden it. But now it was ruined and completely useless. I can only imagine. We don't know how, how long. It's said many days. Uh, but uh, just dirty, half broken down now, you know, fraying all. It's linen, right? Uh, dug up the belt, ruined, completely useless. Then the word of Yahweh came to me. This is what Yahweh says. In the same way, I will ruin the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. These wicked people who refuse to listen to my words, who follow the stubbornness of their hearts and go after other gods to serve and worship them, they will be like this belt, completely useless. For as a belt is bound around a man's waist, so I bound the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah to me, declares Yahweh. To my people, for my renown, for my praise and honor, but they have not listened. So I'm not sure. It doesn't say that uh, Jeremiah went out and wore the belt publicly again. It looks like he did wear it publicly at the beginning, but that would be interesting if Jeremiah is wearing this new belt and everybody's like, hey, new belt, Jeremiah, pretty nice, thanks. <laughs> Yahweh directed me to buy it. And then maybe three weeks later, maybe a month later, he's wearing this ratty, frayed, dirty, same belt. Hey, isn't that the same belt? Yes, and here's God's illustration. You imagine that Jeremiah said this to somebody, uh, you know, in, in addition to writing it down. So, first pretty significant illustration there. Um, I guess we don't get our belts that nasty, but the next time I see an old belt that's worn out, I'll think, ooh, that's like what God does to those who follow the stubbornness of their hearts and pursue false gods. Next one is about wineskins, and I was like, oh, wait, maybe, you know, Jesus said new new wine needs to be put in new wineskins. That's totally different, but it does have to do with wineskins. Say to them, this is what Yahweh, the God of Israel, says. Every wineskin should be filled with wine. And Jeremiah's like, okay, this is a prophecy. And here's the next part. If they say to you, don't we know that every wineskin should be filled with wine? It's like, it's basically like he's saying, tell them something they already know, and then they'll come back like, we know that already. <laughs> you know, why are you telling us something we know already? Here comes the reason and the judgment. Don't we know that every wineskin should be filled with wine? Tell them this is what Yahweh says. I am going to fill with drunkenness all who live in this land, including the kings who sit on David's throne, the priests, the prophets, and all who live in Jerusalem. I will smash them one against the other, fathers and sons alike, declares Yahweh. I will show no pity or mercy or compassion to keep me from destroying them. Wow. Ouch. Strong. This started with a conversation about a daily, everyday thing, filling wine with wineskins. We know that. Boom. Drunkenness leading to destruction. Don't be fooled, friends. Um, drunkenness... Um, I'm actually going to be preaching uh, Ephesians 5. Don't be filled with wine which causes debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. We have a choice. How many people fill themselves with drunkenness daily? We can fill ourselves with something so much more productive. I pray that these people that frequent liquor stores would see the error of their ways and repent. All right. Now this next part. Now interestingly, at verse 15, the margin on my... and the line... Uh, spacing breaks out differently in my Bible, which means it starts getting poetic here. So the first half of the chapter was just kind of regular paragraph form, but all of a sudden it's poetry. But this is really negative stuff. Again, we have that strange idea of negative prophecy encapsulated in something aesthetic, poetry. Hear and pay attention. Do not be arrogant, for Yahweh has spoken. Give glory to Yahweh your God before he brings in the darkness, before your feet stumble on the darkening hills. You will hope for light, but he will turn it to darkness, change it to deep gloom. But if you do not listen... Now, this is interesting, because Yahweh is in the third person, but all of a sudden here's first person. If you do not listen, I will weep in secret. Because of your pride, my eyes will weep bitterly, overflowing with tears. 
You remember that Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. And so it's like he brought these messages from God, but he was hugely emotionally invested and involved. Um, I think I mentioned this a couple of days ago. We have a strong example of kind of a weeping prayer over the, over the status of the Israelites and the status of Jerusalem um, in Daniel when he was in Babylon. It's a wonderful example prayer. But here you see Jeremiah is like, guys, I'm crying for you. I'm weeping for you. Say to the king and the queen mother, okay, here's a message for the leadership. Come down from your thrones and for your glorious crowns, they will fall from your heads. The cities will be shut up. There will be no one to open them. All Judah will be carried into exile, carried completely away. Boy, there's no like weird coded language or symbolism there, right? Judah is going to fall. Lift up your eyes and see those who are coming from the north. We talked about how the Babylonians used the Fertile Crescent and approached Israel from the north. Verse 21, what will you say when Yahweh sets over you those you cultivated as your special allies? Will not pain grip you like that of a woman in labor? Most people have, at some point, if you're a, uh, definitely if you're a mother or an aunt, but probably also if you're a father, you have seen somebody in the grips of the pains of labor. God is saying, this is how you will feel. If you ask yourself, verse 22, why has this happened to me? It is because of your many sins. He's not mincing words. He's not, you know, making it so verbose and long. Why? Because sins. Let's see. Your skirts have been torn off and your body mistreated. That, that illustration repeats in verse 26. I will pull up your skirts over your face so that your shame may be seen. There's our honor and shame reference for today. Oh, there's an even bigger one in Matthew 27 today. But uh, he's talking metaphorically, right? Uh, honor was to be protected. Shame was to be, uh, you know, protected and not shown. But twice in this chapter, yeah, your nakedness, your shame will be exposed. Verse 23, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard change his spots? These things are unchangeable, Russ. Neither can you do good, you who are accustomed to doing evil. So, um, so ingratiated in is the root of sin. It is as impossible to uproot it as a person changing their skin color or the leopard changing their spots. Let's see, is that the only time there's the rhetorical question about the leopard and the spots? I will look up and find out. Verse 24, I will scatter you like chaff, driven by the desert wind. This is your lot, your portion that I have decreed for you, declares Yahweh. Because you have forgotten me and trusted in false gods. Boy, just what Jared, uh, Joshua was warning them against. Like, it's sad that we have to do a big fast forward. Because I always have such hope for Israel, you know? Um, <laughs> I know it took generations to get to this place, but man. Why couldn't you keep it, guys? But then I look at my own generation. Why can't we keep it? You know, uh, occasionally I'll see an old picture, like a high school yearbook picture of our whole class. We had about 40 in my graduating class, and I think fully half of them out of the church. We're doing no better than these guys. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Bring back the zeal, Lord. Last verse here, your adulteries and your lustful neighings. Remember a couple chapters ago we talked about it, like you're like horses in heat. You're neighing lustfully. Your shameless prostitution. I have seen your detestable acts on the hills and in the fields. Woe to you, O Jerusalem! How long will you be unclean? Woe is like just a guttural expression of remorse and what a, what a terrible, what a pitying, Jesus had the seven woes against the Pharisees a couple of days ago. Woe to you. I've seen your detestable acts, probably uh, worshiping at idol, altars of false idols and gods, but it's like going out and committing fornication out in the open fields. It's the spiritual equivalent. Boy. Uh, so I don't think we've had one good news chapter in Jeremiah. We've had some nice portions, but um, Jeremiah did not have an easy task. And he wept and wept over the state of his people. There are times I'm led to weep over my society as well. I have great hope. There's still a lot of good in the land. Everybody who belongs to a church now does it for the right reasons, not because there's a social expectation. Um, but I, I have great concern for the future of our country. 
Oh, that people would read this and take it to heart. Please, dear Lord God, move the hearts of the stubborn once again, dear Lord. Must be just from the Lord's side. I can't imagine how he stays emotionally invested. Generation after generation after generation, we keep committing the same problems. Yeah, we do it in different ways nowadays. But boy, there's still a ton of adultery on the earth. I would say fully... Two billion, three billion people are still uh, idolatrous. I think I said adulterous. I meant to say idolatrous. Because when you consider all the Catholics who brought in uh, idolatry into Christianity and all the Hindus, and then you got all the little animistic religions, it's probably at least half of the, uh, half of the world who isn't. Uh, Muslims are not idolatrous, nor are Protestants. But that's... I mean, that's just, those are significant portions of the world's population. But, man... We are still a people bent on idolatry. And it's surprising, you know, you'd think scientific day and age we wouldn't be worshipping little carved statues. Still see them. See them around in our society. So, anyway, Lord help us. Lord help us. Help us learn the lesson from Jeremiah. Let us resolve in our hearts. Never, never, never going into this foolish stuff. We should learn the lessons from our forefathers. All right, very good. This time we'll turn to the New Testament. Let's go to the book of Matthew. And as we come into Matthew 27, we are in the crux of the gospel and the crux of our entire faith. I didn't even realize as I was saying it, but the word crux, it... The word crooks exists because the key point is the cross. That's where we even get the word crooks from, from the Latin. So I'd like to bow our heads and pray again. I know we prayed for the beginning of this, but uh, to have, I mean, we are beholding the greatest revelation of God here. Jesus' whole ministry was the greatest revelation of God, but the way Jesus acted when the worst was happening to him, uh, I think we can get a lot of stuff wrong in other parts of the Bible, but if we get this correct, Versus if we get other stuff correct, but this wrong. This is, this is key. Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord Jesus, we come in humility. We are going to be beholding you on the cross. So I pray that you would be in our imaginations, dear Lord. We weren't there, but it was our sins that put you there, dear Jesus. Had we been alive at that time, we, just as likely as not, would have been shouting for your crucifixion and watching and perhaps mocking. I pray that we would have been the sincere ones at the foot of the cross, Lord, but um, our whole hearts are open before you, dear Lord. Please teach us, fill us as you see fit. Amen. Now before Jesus actually got crucified, he had to put up with this farce of a trial. And uh, that has been going on through chapter 26 already. We pick up kind of at the midway point in Matthew 27. Now the first story actually uh, flashes away from Jesus to what's going on elsewhere here. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people came to the decision to put Jesus to death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. Now if they decided to put him to death, why did they hand him over to Pilate? The Jews, being occupied by Rome, did not have the official right to execute people. Now, it's true, stonings went on. You know, that was kind of like, maybe they viewed stonings as second-degree murder. Well, it happened in the heat of the moment. How can you control a mob? But they wanted capital punishment. They wanted the statement to go out. Do not rebel against the established order. And it's so funny because the Jews and the Romans were enemies. But when enemies find a common enemy, they become friends for a short time. So verse 3, when Judas, who betrayed him, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 silver coins to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What's that to us, they said. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. A sad end for the one who Jesus for some time had been prophesying that he would be betrayed. I think here in Matthew, it's only in the, in the Last Supper that he talks about a betrayer among them, but in John, he's talking about it from pretty early on. Uh, there is the idea, and I think it's just speculation, but I've heard it several times, and it could be true, 
that Judas perhaps thought he was forcing Jesus into a situation in which he would have to reveal his power. He's like, I'll get him in this situation where he has to, like, blast people back with a, you know, a force field of supernatural power. And then he'll say, you rebels, it's time for me to sit on the throne. It is, you know, because we talked about how all the disciples thought it was a trip upward to glory, right? They didn't perceive it was a trip downward to the humiliation and pain and suffering, torture, death of a cross. So it's possible that Judas, I mean, at this point, Judas is never a likable or enviable character, but at least to be struck with conviction and to try to fix it is in itself good. They weren't going to give up Jesus once they had him. Um, I think it's in the desire of ages that, well, I don't want to step beyond. Uh, could, Jesus, could Judas have repented and received Jesus' forgiveness at this point? I hope so. Um, suicide is a very theologically and ethically problematic thing because the last thing one person that a person is doing is breaking a commandment about killing it. It's killing themselves, and by definition you can't repent. So I do, I, by no means do I expect to see Judas in heaven, but could he... I've heard, I've heard a sermon, and maybe I agree with this, maybe I don't, that um, Judas and Peter weren't so different because Peter denied his Lord three times. Um, and though Peter was brokenhearted to the point of weeping bitterly and thinking he couldn't be forgiven, he accepted Jesus' forgiveness, whereas Judas could not forgive himself and could not accept Jesus' forgiveness. Um, I do think what Judas did is worse, to take money and to lead soldiers to where Jesus was, rather than just deny him three times. I don't know, we can't parse these things, but... Um, Verse 6, the chief priests picked up the coins and said, It is against the law to put this into the treasury, since it is blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That is why it has been called the field of blood to this day. There's another light to this day. Go check it out. There's evidence. Verse 9, then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took the thirty silver coins, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. Now, interesting. So there's a Jeremiah reference here in the New Testament, right? Jeremiah. I love it when Old Testament prophets, particularly ones we're in, are affirmed by the New Testament. When I look at my footnote, it says Jeremiah 19, 1 through 13, Jeremiah 32, 6 through 9, and also Zechariah 11, 12 through 13. So I looked these up. Uh, one of them has to do with buying a field. One of them has to do with selling for silver. Interestingly, in Jeremiah, I think it's 32, it says 17 pieces of silver or something. But then the Zechariah has 30 pieces of silver. So it is a, it's kind of like a blended um, quote, and it only references Jeremiah, not Zechariah. So um, I know that I myself frequently, and you've seen it, <laughs> I quote the wrong a book or chapter accidentally and, um, you know, might blend together two quotes into one. Um, you could say that's what's happening here, a slightly faulty memory. Or you could say the Holy Spirit insp inspired and instructed them to kind of combine three prophecies together into one there. Let's move on to Jesus' actual trial here. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, Yes, it is as you say. When he was accursed by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they're bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. This reminds me of Isaiah 53, like a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he uttered no uh, words. Man, Jesus could have stopped this. He could have stopped this with words. You guys are a bunch of false witnesses. Uh, he could have stopped it with heavenly, as we talked about with Judas, right? Heavenly pushback, calling angels, anything like that. But Jesus let this farce of a trial happen. Why did he let it happen? Uh, he said it, I forget whether it's in this gospel or in John, but I, I know he says it in John. The scriptures must be fulfilled. The Son of Man must die. And we know he predicted it three times in this gospel. Now it was the governor's custom at the feast to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you? 
Bab Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Christ. By the way, Christ is the Greek word for Messiah, the anointed one. For he knew it was out of envy that they had handed Jesus over to him. Pilate is trying to get out of this, and that's slightly admirable. I would almost have pity for Pilate, except over in another spot. I think it's Luke 13. It talks about how Pilate had mingled the blood of the Jews in with uh, his pagan sacrifices. And so Pilate was a cruel guy and a disgusting character, just vile. Um, I think we talked about this back when we were in the Gospels before, uh, that Pilate... There is an account that Pilate ended up committing suicide. I've heard some tie that to regret over this, but there's no historical evidence that it was over this that he committed suicide. So, All right, so he's kind of hoping that they would pick uh, Barabbas. Um, while Pilate was sitting in the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. Wow, so God is sending dreams to the wife of the governor. She's sending messages. Pilate had the ability to free him, but he was intimidated by the mob. Um, I think any of us would have been overwhelmed. I hope I would have done better than Pilate, but I'll tell you my hopes aren't high. Uh, but the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you, they asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall then I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? He asked. They all answered, Crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him. Crucify him. Um, when you don't have a good answer, <laughs> you shout louder with the, you know, you try to use force rather than reason. Um, I think I might have told this story months ago when we were back in the Gospels, but I have to say it again. Every time I get to the crucifying, I remember that at last year university, when I was a kid, they used to do Easter pageants. And they would have it on the campus of the university. It was really well done. I wish, I, uh, man, I should look online to see if it was recorded or something. But they always did this part in like a courtyard at the church where the buildings are like three stories high and there are balconies. And they would do, they would have Pilate on one side and the chief priests and the crowd would yell crucify him. And I remember being like six or seven years old, and I was with my best friend named Jonathan. And when the time came, I started shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And my friend Jonathan said, no, don't shout crucify him. I said, but Jonathan, he has to die for our sins. So like, we're doing the right thing, even though it's the wrong thing, kind of thing. Uh, oh, I wonder if I would have been shouting crucify him had I been there. Am I more of a follower? of leaders, or do I follow the resonations in my heart? Sister White says, every sincere heart resonated with the teachings of Jesus. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, verse 24, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I'm innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. Pilate is trying to say, it's not me, it's not me. All the people answered, let his blood be on us and our children. And many people think that that is the verse where the Jews condemn themselves. You know, um, back in Joshua, we had them saying, far be it from us to ever violate this covenant. And then God sends the, the fulfillment of the covenant, right? And they say, let the blood be on us. Um, I remember when Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ movie came out, it was highly controversial and it was called anti-Semitic because it had this line in there. And it's like, but this line is in the Bible. Like, if he's telling a Bible story, there's nothing that the director is doing that's anti, uh, you know, a certain uh, ethnicity or religion. He's just quoting what's in the Bible. What is in, there are parts of that movie that weren't in the Bible. Um, but th that part is. I don't believe Jewish uh, kids are born with generational blood. Um, um, it does say God punishes to the third and fourth generation those who hate him, but, to the, but blesses to the thousandth generation those who love him. So we're more than three or four generations away from those who crucified Jesus. But some would use this verse, I guess Hitler used verses like this to supposedly justify, although Hitler was anything but Christian. But. So he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. I have heard good sermons that say, we are Barabbas. We are the ones who deserve the cross. We have committed the sins, um, but we get freedom in exchange for Jesus taking 
the whipping post and the cross that were probably intended for Barabbas. Lord help us. Now this le next little paragraph, 27 through 31, often overlooked, but hugely important. And friends, this is a big part why I have for months now been harping on the honor and shame aspect and mocking. We talked about mocking just briefly with like uh, Abraham when Ishmael was mocking Isaac and that was enough to make um, Sarah say that that boy will never have a part of our inheritance because to mock is to heap shame. This, you know, terrible, like stay far from it, this horrible, shameful thing, <laughs> shame, shameful thing. Uh, and what do the soldiers do here now? When the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him, they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. Okay, robe of a king, right? Are they really honoring him as a king? No, they're not, but they're putting a scarlet robe. And then twisted together a crown of thorns. Oh, let's give him his crown. Ha ha ha. But it is ah, pain inducing. I've never had my forehead hurt terribly other than a sunburn, but... I can only imagine to have thorns to the point of bleeding here. Set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand, uh, like a scepter. And they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. Jesus is deserving of the highest worship. He gets the high worship from the angels, from the unfallen worlds. He comes to this rebellious world and he gets mock worship. Hugely ironic. Man, lightning bolts should have come and gotten these guys. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. And he took it. The king of the universe took it. Kept his mouth shut. Kept his dignity even though they were heaping shame a mile high on him. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe. Now here's the speculation on taking off the robe. It just seems like, okay, let's take off this robe. Uh, Jesus had just been flogged, right? Uh, they believed he was given the 40 lashes minus one. Uh, those whips slice open the skin, open wounds on the back. You put cloth on the back. It sets there for a while. You can imagine this mocking worship and the beating on the head might have lasted 20, 30 minutes. They're having a good time. That blood begins to congeal in the open wounds and the robe actually becomes attached. The scabs, the robe is enmeshed in the scabs. So they let that set, and then they pull it off again, reopens all the wounds at the back. So this was more than just shame. It was re-injuring him all over again for the lacerations on his back. Put his own clothes on him, then they led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Siren, and they forced him to carry the cross. I think... Either movies show it or one of the other Gospels says it, that Jesus collapsed under the weight of the cross, couldn't carry it anymore. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Apparently the rock formation there somewhat resembles a skull. I've seen, I think there's one over in uh, Joshua Tree that kind of resembles a skull. I've seen pictures of it. I guess I can see it. Um, there they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall. I think that means vinegar, but after tasting it, and we refuse to drink it. Uh, they say that that's a numbing agent, and maybe Jesus didn't want the numbing. Uh, he wanted to feel the full force of what was happening to him. Of course, the physical aspect was only a part, only one dimension of what was happening to him. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Um, I think it's John that says, uh, you know, a single piece of woven fabric was valuable, and they didn't want to lose the value by ripping it up. So let's cast lots. They did whatever kind of game. They're playing games at the foot of the cross. Again, a huge irony. The, the whole great controversy is coming to a climax, and let's gamble at the foot of the torture device on which the Son of God is. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Now that can be read probably three ways. First of all, we know it's true. That wasn't what they intended, but it was true, King of the Jews. Secondly, this could be the announcement. Doesn't, don't anybody dare claim any kingship against Rome, because this is what we do to people who challenge the emperor's authority. And this also could have been to mock him. Uh, it strikes me as ironic, this phrase that kind of operates on three levels up there. 
Two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right, one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him and shaking their heads and said, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself! Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. Now at this point I should mention that crucifixions were not unheard of, not entirely rare. I mean, I don't think it was a daily occurrence, but certainly people saw many crucifixions throughout their lifetime. Now there are quicker ways to kill a person, right? Uh, there are more efficient ways to kill a person. Crucifixion it minimizes the efficiency and the speed to maximize the shame and the message, don't cross us. Um, and they would put it out on the public road for everybody to see going by. And man, I can't imagine. My little kids, I would probably be like shielding them, averting their... But how can you not see a big display up on the cross? But they, they hurl back his supposed prophecies at him. Beginning of John, tear down this temple and I will raise it again in three days. He was talking about his body, but people took it literally and mocked him uh, for it there. And that added to temptation. You know, I think that, G that Satan's motives were in those jeers. Come down off the cross, save yourself. He could have done it. He could have saved himself instead of saving us. Thank you, Jesus, for staying on the cross. I am unworthy for staying on the cross for it, but you did it, dear Jesus. Thank you. For not giving into the mockers. Oh, you could have showed them all. Thank you, Jesus, for restraining. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. The height of hypocrisy and stubborn hearts, claiming to be sincere. All we need is a sign, and we'll believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him. Now if he wants him. For he said, I am the Son of God. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Now this is interesting. It's only in Luke that you have one of the thieves on the cross repenting and saying, remember me when you come into my kingdom and Jesus offers him salvation. At this point, it sounds like both thieves are mocking him. So did one of the thieves mock him for a while and then have a striking of the conscience and then was forgiven? It is possible that the thief that was forgiven mocked Jesus on the very day that he died. So Jesus' forgiveness becomes all the more profound when you consider that possibility. Verse 45 says, From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. That would be from noon to 3 p.m. They counted the hours of the day from sunrise, which was right about 6 yeah, they were in the Northern Hemisphere, so it shifted some, but that's generally how they did it. About the ninth hour, 3 p.m., Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is very telling, you know, we believe in the Trinity. We believe in like a, an integrated whole of godliness. And Jesus in his ministry, yes, he had his challenges, but he always had the comforting presence the assurance of God the Father and the Holy Spirit, maybe he could sense them somehow. But at this point, the, the Trinity is coming apart. They're withdrawing, and he feels all alone there. And he's crying out, why? What a profound thing that Jesus cried out, why? We cry out, why? We have a Lord, friends, who also cried out, why? So when we feel lost, confused in the dark, it's tough, and I don't want to minimize that toughness, but you can identify with your Savior, and your Savior can identify with you. He knows what it is to feel utterly abandoned and to cry out, Why? Then some of those standing there heard this. They said, He's calling Elijah. So I think the Eli Eli sounds like the first, uh, I think Eliah is how you pronounce it in the Hebrew, and so Eli sounds like it. Um, Anyway, that, they misheard him or something and thought he was calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if I, Elijah comes to save him. Elijah, of course, had famously gone to heaven in a chariot of fire, so they would expect Elijah to be alive. Maybe Elijah will come then. And when Jesus cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. Doesn't mean the conscious part of him, but just the breath, the life breath that God gives all of us. 
At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tomb. And after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. This is incredible, friends. And only Matthew records this part. That there was an earthquake so violent that it resurrected the dead? What? Uh, I like the idea. This is a little bit of spiritual speculation, but I like the idea. And I think there is language that is compatible with this in Ellen White's uh, Desire of Ages. But the idea that it took all the demonic forces to bring Jesus, who had like life original in him, to bring him down into the grave. And that to do that, some of these forces that had their... Uh, that, you know, had their energies keeping people dead, had to let go of those, let them live again, to pull Jesus down into death. I like that idea because it makes it almost seem like life is the default of the universe and death is the active agent that has to stop it and keep it, like, keep a lid on it. But that lid came off when they had to bring Jesus down. It's an interesting idea, but just either way, I mean, miracles to testify that something amazing has happened. Oh, also the rending of the, of the curtain, very, very symbolically telling. Jesus had said already in Matthew 23, your temple is left to, you, left to you desolate. And here is a external symbol of the desolation. But I believe they stitched it up and kept doing the empty forms for a while longer. When the centurion, this is the Roman guard, and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. So seeing the darkness, seeing the earthquake, seeing... I mean, Jesus is converting people in his death here. And could you imagine the horror on the voice to say, What have we done? We've killed the Son of God. Many women were there, watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. So you may remember Isaiah 53, he was assigned a tomb among the wealthy and the corrupt. So it was known where his tomb was. And praise the Lord for a wealthy person using his wealth to honor Jesus, even in death. That was an important thing in um, ancient Middle East culture, still is, to honor those that you love, even in death. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made a tomb secure, the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. So the seal, I don't think, actually prevented anybody from rolling it away, but it was like a wax thing, like they did with letters, so that you could see if it had been opened or not. If the seal stayed solid, you know it was never opened. So, trying to prevent the miracle that Jesus said would happen. Oh, men are futile trying to stop the miracle of Jesus. I pray that we do more than just read the text. I pray that we put ourselves at the foot of the cross. This is where we are to go whenever we confess sins. You know, in Old Testament times, they would bring their altar to sacrifice and put the hands on the head. We give our sins to Jesus. Um, there's a paradox, a time paradox at the cross too, because the sins I commit tomorrow and the next day, confess them, Jesus has already borne them and paid the price for them. <clears throat> so... Sister White says that we would do well to 
spend an hour a day considering and I guess imagining the closing scenes of Jesus' life, particularly the cross. Everything has to be put down at the foot of the cross. Our pride, our ambition, selfishness, jealousies. Um, none of us are worthy of this sacrifice. Jesus was happy to give it. He, Hebrews says he did it for the joy set before him. We'll never be worthy of this sacrifice, but we can be appreciative. We can be profoundly different than those who mocked him at the foot of the cross. Dear Lord Jesus, please help us. Please help us to have a right view of what you have done for us. We will never plumb the depths, dear Lord Jesus. I pray that we would be profoundly grateful. You have done it all, dear Jesus. Thank you so much, dear Jesus. Amen. Now you may have noticed in this account, we don't get all the things that Jesus said. Hey, wait, I thought he said this and this. I thought this other thing happened. Uh, it's true that the, the crucifixion scene that we hold in our heads is a conglomeration of the four accounts. Um, Jesus said seven statements on the cross, but none of the Gospels has all seven statements. So we saw something like three of them here. Most of them have three or four, but when you put them together, it makes seven. So the couple that we had here, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is that the only one? Because my red letter Bible, hmm, okay, and the other one it says like, you know, he gave a loud cry, but notice in this one we didn't see him praying for the forgiveness of the soldiers crucifying him. This is part of why I'm so glad we have four Gospels, because, you know, surely we would have enough knowledge necessary for salvation just having one of these, but to round it out and to have a more complete concept of it. So if you want to, even today, you can go read Mark's account, Luke's account, John's account, to really get um, the three-dimensional picture of everything that happened. Well, friends, I am thankful to Jesus for the sacrifice. It is because of this scene, this chapter, that we don't do the sacrificial part of the Old Covenant. And aren't you glad we don't have to do the sacrificial part? That would be ugly and bloody. It would help us to hate sin, surely would. But uh, I think we can pray the authentic prayer. Lord, help me to hate sin just in the way that seeing the blood and gore of a sacrifice of an innocent animal dying because I should be dying made them hate the sin. Help me to hate the sin. I want to love righteousness the way you love righteousness. And I want to hate sin because it puts a death sentence on me, but then it kills you, dear Jesus, instead of me. So Lord, help us to all have a right concept. And this is why the Bible says that Christianity is incompatible with the world. Because the world says, you know, follow your dreams, your passions, believe in yourself, go for the glory. And yeah, you know, like success and striving on the one level is not sinful in and of itself. I mean, we see God use successful people, wealthy Joseph of Arimathea here helping him out with his wealth. But it's just, it's entirely different to come to the foot of the cross and stop and humble oneself at the all-sufficient sacrifice. Like I said, there's no place for pride, no place for, hey, I'm better than you. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. Well, I could reminisce on this for a lot longer. But I think we'll move on to the book of Acts now. Praise the Lord, there is a happy... I don't even want to... I want to experience the valley, so... <laughs> tomorrow. Come back tomorrow. Uh, but book of Acts, it's already in the light of it. So, you know, you know the ending. Um, but, especially around Easter time, I like to spend a week focusing just on the crucifixion. Because they, those original folks, experienced the crucifixion with no idea, even though Jesus had said it, like it didn't get through their heads. Uh, no idea that Sunday was coming. So, yeah. All right. Well, January, Pastor Mark is going to take over on Acts chapter 4. I wish you a good Sabbath, dear brothers and sisters. Maybe the Sabbath is already ending as you're watching this, if you watch it in the evening. But I pray it either is or has been a good Sabbath. And pray that the week ahead of you is blessed, that you are refreshed, rejuvenated, uh, to do your daily tasks and do so in the knowledge, the glory, the shadow of all the goodness that God has given you. Uh, January, Pastor Mark will also give a closing prayer. Thanks so much for spending the time. God bless. Bye.
Let's go to our last book of the Bible now. Thanks for sticking with us on a longish video. I hope you're enjoying this. Man, to me, this is better than spending an hour on Netflix or whatever. Uh, Acts chapter 4. So we've just had the healing in chapter 3 of the lame man, the frequent beggar who everybody knew about. And um, Peter starts preaching, you know, uh, repentance and Jesus conquering the grave and uh, offering eternal life and forgiveness and the Holy Spirit in him. But now it gets noticed by the powers that be. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail overnight. Uh, but many who overheard the message believed. The number of people who believed grew to about 5,000. So we saw the 3,000 on Pentecost Day. This could very well be just a couple days later. Now it's up to 5,000. The sermon worked. The sermon had its intended effect. Much more than this individual man being able to walk. That's a blessing. That's a benefit. Good for him. Now multiple dozens, hundreds, thousands of people have believed because of the powerful witness. And I still believe. Uh, I do believe in modern day miracles and I believe that their greatest intention is yes to bring alleviation to the person that's healed but more to be a testimony to people who are on the fence about believing and not. That can be something that brings them into the full belief. And the Lord knows when to use it. We have to trust his wisdom when he chooses not to. That is in many ways the hardest thing about believing in miracles is submitting ourselves to his will, acknowledging that sometimes he will not uh, save us. But when he does, praise the Lord and we we definitely testify about that, just like these guys did. So the next day, the leaders of the law and the temple, the high priest is there. They bring John and Peter out before them. And they say, by what power and by what name do you do this? And it says, verse 8, Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit as he responds. This reminds me when Jesus said, uh, when you get dragged in front of governors, kings, rulers, priests, do not worry about what you're going to say because the Holy Spirit will give you the words you need to say in the moment. And this is happening here. Peter gets up and he's filled with the Holy Ghost and he says to them, we are being called on account today for an act of kindness shown to a lame man who is, and now we're being asked how he was healed. How ironic that we are being persecuted and questioned for having done something that is so good. Know this, verse 10, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. So he boldly says it. I will answer this question in whose name? Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he points the finger directly. You crucified him, but the Lord has brought him back from the dead. It is by that name that this man stands before you. Now, Peter is going to go into quoting Psalm 118. Jesus is the stone the builders rejected, but he has now become the cornerstone of our faith. Verse 12, I love this verse. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given by which mankind must be saved. Christianity is an exclusive religion. Uh, I've had uh, people say to me, um, I've had actually polytheists like from India say to me, um, we accept your God, why can't you accept our gods? And it's not because we want to be mean, it's not because we want to be arbitrarily exclusive, but Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, the life, not a way, a truth, a life. And here, again, there is the only name by which men are saved. There is no other name under the whole heaven. Jesus alone is our Savior. I will affirm him till the day I die. Help me, Jesus. Verse 13, I love this too. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men. Ay, ay, ay. These guys are talking boldly back to us and they have not, you know, these are not PhDs. These are not master students. These are blue-collar workers. They, it's like they're understanding that the power must have come from a supernatural source. They were astonished, it says in verse 13. They took note that these people had been with Jesus. Since they could clearly see, verse 14, the man who'd been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. What do you do to, uh, to refute an overt miracle? There's nothing you can do. You can't deny it. This guy was well known. And here he is standing there. That's fascinating that the man came back the next day to be part of this trial. Uh, let's see. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin. They confer together. What are we going to do with these men? Everyone living in Jerusalem knows that they have performed this significant sign. We cannot deny it. But to stop this from spreading any further, we must warn them no longer to speak in the name of Jesus. Verse 18, they call them in again and command them not to preach anymore in the name of Jesus. And Peter answers, I love this one too. This is like the third 
just like great verse in the chapter here. What is right in God's eyes to obey you or God? Who, who are we going to obey here? Answer is obvious. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. These witnesses were compelled. They can't help it. How can we talk about anything else but the greatest thing that has happened in all of our lives, in all of Israel's history? We can't be quiet. Your sources of intimidation mean nothing to us. Verse 21, after further threats, they let them go. Imagine that. You know, we'll beat you, we'll flog you. That's so, that's, that's peanuts compared to the great glory of knowing Jesus and knowing this wonderful new truth. Uh, it says that those leaders could not decide how to punish them because all the people were still praising God for what had happened. The man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old, full-grown adult, undeniable. On their release, the believers come together, they pray powerfully, they affirm, latter part of verse 24, you made the heavens, the earth, the sea, everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through your servant, David. And here they quote Psalm, two, one in, Psalm chapter two, verses one and two. Why do the nations rage? Why do they plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise together against the Lord and against his anointed one, against his Messiah. That was truly being fulfilled here. And uh, verse 29, they pray for more Holy Spirit boldness. Enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. They were already doing this, but they wanted more. What a thing. Man, when was the last time we prayed for boldness to speak no matter what situation, no matter when or where? Not to be annoying, but to speak in the power of God. God still wants to save people in our midst, dear brothers and sisters. Stretch out your hand now to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. They've already been doing miracles, but they're asking for more. That's a beautiful thing. I think we're not to be satisfied. When we get something, thanks God, that's all I needed. More, please, if you will grant it, dear Lord, more, please. After the pray, the place where they were meeting was shaken. So this is like heavenly affirmation in the form of an earthquake. No, could you imagine that? And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Praise the Lord. A second affirmation uh, here after the day of Pentecost. And then uh, the last few verses here, another idyllic description of the early church. We had one in Acts 2. Here's another one in Acts 4. The believers were in one heart and mind. Dear friends, let there be no grudge. Let there be no friction. It is such a tragedy to lose the vision of what God has for his church for petty differences. Let's try to live up to this. Let, let us be of one heart and mind like the early church. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they started sharing everything. With great power, the apostles continued to testify the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. God's grace was powerfully at work in them all. There were no needy people among them. Wow, dear friends, what a thing to strive for. That all the, all the possessions, they just, they just become the ability to help others. It's nothing about hoarding and it's mine and and stuff, and so I pray that a heart of generosity would, would surge out in us as well. Obviously, each person is welcome in their own hearts to decide, you know, how much to share or in what form to share it, but I just pray that generosity and selflessness would lead all of our decisions. Let Lord take care of it. He's, he's the king of all the silver and the gold anyway. Those who had ha land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. They wanted to donate to the church because the cause of the church was so much bigger than having, you know, the nice house, the big enviable possessions, you know. And interestingly, the last couple verses here, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus. Who are we talking about? I don't know any Joseph who the apostles also called Barnabas. I double-checked that in the commentary, and yes, this is the Barnabas who later goes on the missionary journeys with Paul. Uh, the Barnabas there, that nickname means the son of encouragement, and how he lived up to that nickname. So here we see his first act of generosity. He sold a field that he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. What a beautiful thing, dear friends, to have this image of the early church. We are the continuation of this movement. Can you believe it, friends? Forgive us, dear Lord, for when we just think of it as like a stolid institution. This is to be a movement fueled by the Holy Spirit. Jesus said the Holy Spirit is like wind. I sometimes worry that the walls we build, literal and just like institutional, I worry that it uh, can block out the Holy Spirit. You know, uh, wind can be blocked by a strong building, and uh, we want... We want the doors to be open so that the wind can flow through. That has a new significance in the time of the pandemic. The two Sabbaths that we did have church here in Anaheim, we did have all the doors open so that the wind could come through uh, because of the pandemic. But it, that's an interesting illustration that there is sickness and stagnancy, but there is health in the flowing of the air, also with the Holy Spirit. 
Dear friends, thank you for spending this time together. I hope it has been as much of a blessing for you as it has been for me. May God bless your work week. Don't know if you're watching or listening to this before work or after work, but whenever it is, may God bless your week. I'm so filled with love for all of you, dear brothers and sisters. Uh, whether you're watching from our two congregations or elsewhere in California or elsewhere afar off, I pray a blessing for you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord Jesus, you have been so wonderful to us. Thank you for the immense patience that you showed to Cain, trying to work things out with him even as he stubbornly rebelled. We have our own stubborn rebellions too, dear Lord. Pray not as severe as Cain. Lord, we saw the discouragement of the children of Israel in trying to rebuild the temple, how they got intimidated and then forced to stop. We also face um, uh, setbacks, dear Lord, and stoppages in progress that we want. But help us to know we're not the first ones to experience this. Your people experienced that before, and yet they persevered through, and eventually that temple got built. We'll see that in future chapters. Thank you for dear Jesus, Lord, resisting those temptations, even at his weakest point. Thank you, dear Jesus, for enabling us to resist temptation also. We can have victory in you. And thank you, Jesus, for calling those ordinary, ordinary people doing their regular tasks to a life that changed the world. Thank you for changing the world through these ordinary people. Two of the biggest apostles right there, Peter and John, right there. Lord Jesus, thank you for the vision of the early church. I pray that we can live up to that. I pray that we can be the latest chapter in the wonderful movement that is your church, dear Lord. Please forgive us when we fall short of that goal, and please continue to help us to strive for that goal, dear Lord. I'm very saddened how the church has lost reputation and lost repute in the last decades. It used to be that ministers were kind of looked up to, but because many ministers have abused their office, either through financial problems or scandals, dear Lord, they have fallen from a position of respect. Not that we need to respect the people. We're not like the Pharisees, Lord, but I just wish that the church was respected in society. May your Holy Spirit flow through us, Lord, and may people be convinced and compelled that there is nothing else like living in church community, living for you. Love you so much, dear Jesus. I pray that you send this video into the news feed of just all the sincere people who need to see it. I needed this blessing today, dear Lord. Please continue to bless us with um, showers of blessing. We need them. Pray a blessing on the remainder of our week. Pray to see our brothers and sisters again and tomorrow when we will be in chapter 5 of these same four books. We pray that you will keep us healthy and safe until then. We pray all this in Jesus' blessed name. Amen. Well, thank you so much, dear friends, for having uh, been on, a, on this journey with us. It's going to continue. I believe there are so, so many more blessings throughout this. I uh, pray that you will be encouraged every day. God bless you. I uh, pray that you have a wonderful week, and we will uh, pray to see you tomorrow, and hopefully in person at our outdoor services on Sabbath. However, we understand if you're wanting to stay away, to be extra safe from the pandemic. God bless you all, dear friends. Goodbye.